So, so folks, I'd, I'd like, like to open the floor to uh, questions that you may have, and uh, we're going to use these microphones that we hope are going to work. And uh, I'll place one right here, and I'll uh, put a mic on it right here. And then if, you'll, if you have a question, if you just come down, we have a few. One eager volunteer right there. Hello again. Hello. Uh, what are the main differences between the SLS and the Constellation program? Why is SLS replacing the Constellation program? I always get all the hard questions. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, the, one, the one big difference I can think of between SLS and the Constellation program, and first let's just briefly talk about the Constellation program as it existed. Uh, there was a, a, a people rocket. Um, it was uh, about 360 feet tall, consisted of a booster uh, that was a lot like one of the space shuttles, uh, solid rocket boosters, a second stage that was a liquid second stage and a, and a people capsule at the top. And then there was, that was the Ares-1, the Ares-5 was a larger rocket but no people. Uh, really, in a nutshell, what the SLS is, it's, it's both of those things together as one. Uh, and and uh, I, th I think we looked upon the cost of building two separate rockets as cost prohibitive, so we're going to put it all together in one package. And that's a gross oversimplification, but that is really what the crux of it is all about. Yeah. Uh, we'll come over on this side over here, this young man right here. Go ahead with your question. Can, you, can you yell that question, please? The question is, what do you eat in space? Uh, just about anything we want. Um, uh, uh, my favorite is, uh, is crawfish etouffee, or uh, <laughs> we also have um, uh, seafood gumbo, they're my two favorites. And believe it or not, we actually eat those things. Um, we have, the meals that we eat in space are not too unlike some of the meals ready to eat that our soldiers eat overseas. It's called thermostabilized food. Uh, about a third of our food is thermostabilized, so it's pre-cooked and it's good for about six months or a year. Uh, and then the next uh, is we have rehydratable food, so like mashed potatoes, uh, cereal, um, vegetables, uh, shrimp cocktail, one of my favorites, by the way, uh, all rehydratable, and, uh, and we can eat those. And then we take some fresh food with us, not much. Uh, you know, you stay away from bananas because they go bad real quick. Apples hang around for a little while. And we also take one of the most coveted things when we get up to the International Space Station that we take with us for those poor folks who haven't had any fresh food or vegetables for about three or four months as we take oranges. They just love oranges for some reason. So uh, they love oranges, they love lemons, and I don't know, you know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's that natural tendency to want to have vitamin C if you haven't had it for a long time, but I think it's, it's the smell, that freshness, because, you know, the air on the space station is very stale. I'm getting way off your question, but this is actually an answer to a very good question, you know, because they say, what does the space station smell like? And, and the air is actually, it's very sterile, and uh, anything that can add a little bit of kind of that earth sense uh, to, uh, to, to life up there, uh, astronauts love. So we take them oranges. So there you go, that's the whole food angle. Right. That was a great question. Though. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Chris, thanks for coming, first of all. Sure. Um, I want to piggyback off uh, the first question a little bit um, about the space launch system. People in my age bracket in kind of the mid-20s were really excited about new space, commercial space, SpaceX and whatnot like that, um, particularly because of the uh, efficient contracting, how, how much more affordable it is. And it occurred to me that looking at the tech specs for the SLS and the, the Elon Musk's Falcon Heavy rocket, the most powerful rocket since the Saturn V, that two, fa that two Falcon Heavies could do the job of one SLS. And I'm wondering um, if NASA has considered that as another cost-saving measure. And basically, is commercial crew scalable up to lunar, beyond, low Earth orbit type functions? Boy, if you talk to Elon Musk, Elon Musk will tell you that commercial crew can do everything that, uh, that the SLS can do and beyond. Um, you're catching me, uh, probably not, not an area that I would consider my core expertise because we've been do, busy doing the space shuttle flight thing for the last year while all this has evolved. But I, I do know that when you talk about it, can you just scale up commercial space, you know, these rockets that are designed to carry people to low Earth orbit to make them your rocket that will carry humans beyond and perhaps to Mars. And I would imagine you can scale any rocket. I do know that, that the, uh, the SLS has a lot of heritage that dates back to Constellation. You know, we have done innumerable studies ever since we said we were going to shut the shuttle down in 2004 to determine the best way, the most cost-efficient way 
the, the, the way that makes use of most of the resources that we have in place today, the, uh, the assembly uh, of the, um, uh, the solid rocket boosters, the use of the solid rocket boosters, the use of LOX and hydrogen in, in, as a propellant. Uh, we, have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of powerful rocket engines that use those as a propellant. The uh, SpaceX Merlin engine is a uh, uh, RP, R, which is a uh, RP, which is a um, uh, Kerosene. 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 I'm sorry. Car yeah, it's a LOX kerosene engine, and it, it, it it's not as efficient as some of those rocket engines that it, that are designed to like the Space Shuttle's main engine was an extraordinarily efficient engine. Um, so I'm probably not giving you the answer to your question, but I'm working on it really hard. Um, I, I don't think that you can scale up those kind of things to give you 130 metric tons. That's just the number I'm gonna throw out right now because that, that is the holy grail of heavy lift is to get 130 metric tons to low Earth orbit. I don't think you can do that by scaling up you know, Merlin engines until you just can't stand Merlin engines anymore. Each of those things I think in, in a vacuum has about do you know how much thrust a Merlin has in, in a vacuum? Uh, it's, a, it's, <laughs> the most, it's the most powerful uh, uh, solid, uh, uh, liquid fuel rocket engine ever built. So the uh, Saturn V's were uh, 1.5 million. million. They were also our Merlins are not quite up there. No, Merlins are close. But, but uh, I don't know if Merlins are going to give you what you want to get a package like that to Mars. I, I really don't think so. But you can tell them outside of my bounds a little bit. We'll, we'll have a workshop on that this week. Folks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. This is, all, this is all news to everybody. I mean, this is, this is really good stuff. This young man right here, yes. You want to know about Merlin engines too, don't you? You want to know how many metric tons to lower Earth orbit that the constellation can... No, I'm, I'm kidding. You want to know how you sleep in space, right? Sort of. Okay, what's your real, what's your real question? Have we ever, okay, so have we ever had a malfunction, is it a mal, okay, so we've launched a rocket into space now, it has a major malfunction and all the electronics go away. Is, is that your question? Um, not to my knowledge. And, and I'll tell you why, not because things don't break, because things break, things always break. But what is, what's very crucial to designing a rocket is, is this thing called redundancy. And that's the way we get away from those little failures that we, that we occur when your windshield wipers go off in your car for no reason at all or you get a flat tire. We build redundant systems so we can take over the function of those things when they break. For example, in the space shuttle, we had three fuel cells. Fuel cells is what we use to generate power. We could power the shuttle using any one of those three. We typically ran all three, but we, we only use uh, you know, two, really two fuel cells worth of power at a time. On the International Space Station, we have eight solar arrays. We can do without two or even four of them, but we have this capability to have backup systems which will help us out if we ever have a bad failure, but we haven't had anything like that yet. Probably the closest we come was experienced by the Russians uh, on the Mir Space Station. I don't know if any of you remember when a Progress cargo spacecraft crashed into the Mir, yep. and we really almost lost the crew back then. It, uh, it breached the pressure hull when the two vehicles met, and the, uh, the atmosphere inside the Mir space station was escaping out into space. And it was really through the heroic astronauts, or the, the heroic action of the cosmonauts. We actually had America on board at the time uh, that, that saved that spacecraft. And that's probably what I would say the most significant failure we've ever had in space between all of the space faring nations. Did you get it? You looked at you were nodding your head. <laughs> yeah, okay, way to go. Thanks very much. What's your name? Jeffrey. Jeffrey, okay. Folks, we have time for just two more questions. Than the young man. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking my question. Chris, I was standing on the beach in Titusville looking across the Indian River, and for us, because of weather, there was a solid half hour of on and off delays. So the entire beach, every time there was a delay, there was a, a sigh, and every time it was back on again, there was a, a clapping of hands and screaming, and this went all the way till the launch, and I believe the launch was like about two minutes off schedule. Mm -hmm. And I have to know, I really have to know, Chris, were you doing ahs and clapping your hands when it finally, no. while this was happening? No, not at all. And actually, even though it appeared that the launch was off, it was back on again, we, we marched to a very narrow launch window. We, we can only launch inside this five minute window and it really is all comes down to timing. Was anybody at landing, by the way? Did anybody ever, somebody was at landing? So what happens just before the space shuttle lands? And I actually have a point here, so hang on to that. Okay. Just before the space shuttle lands, the space station flies right over there. I mean, that just happens because the space shuttle just came from the space station. 
In a similar fashion, we have to wait until the space station flies directly over the Kennedy Space Center before we can launch the space shuttle, or else we're going to spend days and days catching up to it. Uh, or, even worse, we launch in the wrong orbit, which we don't want to do. Uh, so we have a very narrow launch window, and if the weather is not good during that five-minute launch window, we don't launch. Um, all we can do is hope that that giant hole in the clouds there happens to be over the Kennedy Space Center at the time that we, we hit our launch window. Uh, now, we did have another failure at 31 seconds, and you saw that that was uh, alluded to a little bit in the video, and that was the source of the two-minute delay, and that was something that was completely, to me, unexpected. I, I was not even aware of what the failure was, but you heard that the launch count held at 31 seconds due to a failure. Mm -hmm. There's an automatic launch sequ sequencer that watches all these parameters to make sure that the shuttle's in a good configuration to launch. Well, you, have you ever seen that little beanie cap thing that sits on top of the external tank and, mm -hmm. and just before launch it, it swings out of the way? Well, one of the indications that would say that that thing is out of the way of the space shuttle, uh, they only got one of the two indications. So they held the launch automatically because of that. And it was only about a minute into this launch, I realized they were actually talking about the beanie cap. They called it the GVA, the Gox vent arm. And they're, they're holding launch all the while, and we're approaching the end of this launch window. We can't hold beyond five minutes, and we're already two and a half minutes into this. And I realized, wow, they're talking about that thing right out the window right here. I mean, I could can, I can turn my head and look at it, and, uh, you know, I, I was so tempted <laughs> to say, it looks good to me, let's go. <laughs> but, but you have to let the professionals do their job and go through the motions. And they, they got a camera around and they, had, had, and they had to have two forms of verification that that thing was in fact clear of the space shuttle because you didn't, certainly didn't want to impact it on the, on the way up. So that was the source actually of the two minute delay. But the weather was very questionable the entire time. I'm really surprised we went that day. I was thank you for I, Okay, but I, I was impressed. I didn't have to come back. <laughs> and neither did we. Thank you. <laughs> How was the traffic going home? Was it Carmageddon, like they said? It, uh, it wasn't bad. People asked me about the crowds. I, I, I don't know. They were just there. I, I, All right, good. But it was a good ship. But we had a great ride out of town, too. We didn't have no train. <laughs> How many spaceships launched up in space? What's your name, Sam? Sam? That's a good question, Sam. How many spaceships have launched? Well, I'm going to have to do a little counting, and I'll uh, keep it real brief. There's 135 space shuttle flights. There is about, oh, I'm going to go off here, there's probably seven or eight Apollo flights. Mm -hmm. There was uh, maybe 10 Gemini flights. Uh, and you're, uh, I'm sure you're referring to ones that astronauts were in, right? There were some Skylab flights. And then the Russians, there's probably several hundred uh, by the Russians as well. Let me tell you this. This may be what you want to know. How many astronauts have flown in the, in the space shuttle? 360-ish have flown in the space shuttle. Uh, a lot of those were repeat flyers, like I flew three different times. So you can do the math. Typically six people, 135 shuttle flights, you know, maybe about 850 seats to space on space shuttles which were occupied by 360-ish different astronauts. I answered a question, but again, it was not your question. I did my best. Thank you very much, Sam. Thanks, Sam.